So we've seen that microprocessors are made of millions of switches called transistors. And we've seen how to make a microprocessor by projecting light. I now want to explain something very extraordinary about this way of making microprocessors. The cost of making a wafer such as this doesn't really depend very much on the exact details of what we make on the surface of it. In particular, if we make all the transistors half the size, then we can fit four times as many transistors onto the wafer, and so we can fit four times as many processors. And that means each processor is now only a quarter of the cost. Now, usually in life, things which are cheaper are not as good as expensive things. But in the case of microprocessors, something amazing happens. When we make the transistors smaller, they actually become faster. If we think back to that water model earlier, if we made it smaller, the cylinder could fill up with water more quickly. And the same is true of transistors. A smaller transistor can fill up with electrical charge more quickly. Now, faster transistors means the computer is more powerful. The rate at which transistors switch on and off is called the clock speed. And if you've bought a computer recently, it might have a clock speed of, let's say, 3 gigahertz. That means the transistors are switching on and off 3,000 million times a second. So smaller transistors means they're faster and it means they're cheaper. And also, having lots of transistors to play with allows the designers of the microprocessor to use more sophisticated circuits. And that also allows the processor to run faster. Now, this extraordinary result explains why it is that computers have improved in such a dramatic way over the last 50 years. But remember, I said that a couple of years ago, we hit a big problem, which threatens to stop further growth in the speed of processors. Now, to see what that problem is, I'd like to try a little experiment. And I'd like you all to join in, please. I'd like you to imagine that each of you is a transistor in a microprocessor. Now, at the moment, you're all switched off, so you're all nice and relaxed and nice and cool. OK, what I'd like you to do, I'd like you all stand up, please. OK, now you're all transistors that are switched on. But you're not using too much energy, so you're still fairly cool. OK, I'd like you to sit down, please. And I'd like you to stand up again, please. OK, sit down. OK, could you all stand up, please? OK, you can all sit down now, thank you. OK, so by now you're probably feeling quite a bit hotter. Now imagine that we pack twice as many of you into the same space and ask you all to stand up and sit down again. Then you'd be generating twice as much heat and we'd need more ventilation to keep you cool. Now imagine we also ask you to stand up and sit down twice as fast then you generate even more heat and we'd need even more cooling. Well, it's just like this for the transistors in a microprocessor. When they're off, they don't use much energy, they don't produce much heat. When they're on, they also don't produce much heat. It's only when they're switching between on and off that they use energy and produce heat. Now, to see why it is that transistors only produce heat when they switch, let's look again at our water model. So this is just like the previous model that you saw. The only difference is that we've added a second valve here. Now this valve is the opposite way round to the first one. So when the first one is closed or off, the second one is on or open. And when this one is off, the first one is on. So let's see what happens when we allow high pressure water into the cylinder. So as the piston switches on this valve, it allows water to flow through into the container. But in a moment or two, this second valve will close, and so the flow of water stops. Now, the flow of water, remember, is like the flow of electrical current. So what the designers of microprocessors do is they do a similar trick. They use transistors in pairs so that when one of them is on, there's another one which is off, and that stops current flowing. And the flow of current uses power, and that generates heat. So because the transistors only produce heat when they're actually switching, it means that modern microprocessors are very efficient in their use of energy. So making transistors smaller makes them faster, and it makes them cheaper, but it also means they produce more heat per unit area. 
So although modern microprocessors are very efficient, as we approach a billion transistors on a chip, they're going to be producing a lot of heat. Now to show you just how much heat, we did a little experiment. We took a standard personal computer, which you see on the right here, and then Ian and Nathan took it all apart and laid all the components out on a board. And over here, we see the end result. Here are the different parts of the computer laid out. This is the main circuit board of the computer. This is called the motherboard. This houses many of the important components. For example, along here we have the memory chips. And this is the power supply here. This is the hard disk. This stores all the data and the software. And the processor itself is on the motherboard. It's underneath here. And usually, on top of the processor, we have a piece of metal like this, which is called a heat sink. And on top of the heat sink, we have a little fan to keep it cool. Now, we've removed the heat sink, and we've replaced it with this copper dish. Now, this computer's been sitting here for a while, doing a 1,000 million calculations a second. And so what I have here is an egg. I'm just going to crack the egg and put it into that uh, copper dish. And uh, we'll come back to that in just a moment and see how that's getting on. Meanwhile, let's just have a look at a little photograph of a computer circuit board. And this photograph has been taken with a special camera called a thermal imaging camera. And so the different colors here represent different temperatures. So the purples and the blues, those are low temperatures. And the yellows and reds are hotter temperatures. The white is the hottest of all. What we can see is that the hottest part of the computer is actually the microprocessor. OK, let's have a look and see how our egg's getting on. And it's actually cooking very nicely, in fact. I think my supper will be ready by the end of the lecture. OK. Now, really, that's just a bit of fun. But in fact, heat has become one of the biggest problems that microprocessor designers have to face today. In fact, a microprocessor today is producing the same heat density as the hot plate on a cooker. If we just continue to double the speed of processors every two years, then in 10 years' time, the heat density on a microprocessor will be the same as the heat density at the surface of the sun. Now, unless that heat can be taken away quickly, the processor will overheat and fail. So heat has become the main factor which limits the speed of modern microprocessors. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, instead of just switching the transistors on and off even faster, Manufacturers are trying a different approach. A couple of years ago, they started putting two computing engines called cores on the same chip. And we have here the photograph that we've seen earlier. And you may have noticed that this part of the processor looks a lot like this part. In fact, this is just a copy of this part. These are actually two separate processing cores on the same piece of silicon. Now, with two cores running at the same speed, that processor should be twice as fast. And we call this parallel processing. There's a little snag, however. Not all tasks can be shared. For example, it takes a woman nine months to make a baby. But nine women can't make a baby in one month. <laughs> now, fortunately, many important computational problems can be shared efficiently across many cores. So over the next few years, we'll see processors with four cores, eight cores, 16 cores, and so on. And this will allow the speed of processors to continue to double every two years for at least some time to come. But is there a way to build vastly more powerful computers? Well, here's one idea. This is a model of what's called a carbon nanotube. Each of these is a carbon atom. Now, if we can build a transistor out of carbon nanotubes, it could, it could switch a thousand times faster than a transistor made of silicon. Now, here's an even more exotic idea. What about using DNA to store information and to process it? A computer made of DNA could be 10 billion times more energy efficient than a computer made out of silicon. And the DNA in one human body can store 10,000 times as much data as all the personal computers in the world put together. Now, it's unlikely that general purpose computers will ever be made out of DNA. 
but one day we might be able to build intelligent drugs that use DNA computation to detect, for example, when a cell is about to become cancerous and to take the appropriate action. Now, it might be many decades before ideas such as these become reality. But in tomorrow's lecture, we'll look at some of the amazing new technologies that are already changing the way in which humans and computers interact with each other. Join me then. Thank you. <laughs>